The technological challenge of implants is being able to replace a failed biological component with a completely different material and design and not have any negative effects on the body. Implants differ from transplants in the fact they are manufactured components and not made from natural or living substances. According to Neely and Pond in Materials and Design, implants are typically implemented to achieve one of the five following functions. Aid the healing process of tissue, replace damaged, diseased, or worn parts of the anatomy, correct deformities, simulate congenitally absent or underdeveloped parts of the body, and improve the function of organs. Implants can be intended to remain in the body for only a short while or may be designed to permanently replace or assist damaged tissue. One of the first evidence of implants, discovered in Honduras in 1931 of Mayan origin, was three tooth-shaped pieces of shell, dating from about 600 AD. The first recorded use of metal implants is thought to be when Petronius used gold to reconstruct a cleft lip in 1565 but by the 19th century, a variety of metals were being used for implants, including iron, lead, bronze, and platinum. We now know that few metals are capable and safe to be implanted into body tissue. These include tantalum, zirconia, and, if meant for load-bearing purposes, stainless steel and titanium alloys. There have been recent concerns about the corrosion or degradation of titanium implants and the possible harmful effects of this debris on the body. In order to better understand the consequences of these leaks, researchers have recently been developing ways to closely monitor titanium content in the bloodstream of patients. In order for the implants to do their jobs properly, efficiently, and safely, there are certain molecular properties that are needed to keep the implants from wearing down or damaging the body. Materials used for joint replacements in particular should have a low Young's modulus, or stiffness, to be most compatible with bone tissue. Implants also need to be constructed so that they don't release toxins into the body, which has happened with some of the metals used. Another problem that implants face is corrosion, because our bodies are full of fluids that are aggressive towards metals. The type of metal can affect the corrosion, but a lot of the corrosion threats are taken care of during the processing of the metals. Implants also have to be able to withstand fatigue and wear for long periods of time in the body's harsh conditions. When it comes to finding the right material for implants, there are many benefits to titanium. First, it has the highest safety rating of all the materials currently being used for implants. Titanium is also known for its extraordinary tissue compatibility and its excellent corrosion resistance in air and biological environments. Titanium also has a very high tinsel strength and is very pliable. Titanium exists in two main phases. The alpha phase, which is the most common at room temperature, is a crystal structure with a hexagonal close-packed unit cell, while the beta phase, a crystal structure with a body-centered cubic unit cell, occurs at temperatures closer to titanium's melting point. The titanium microstructure, however, can contain sections of both alpha and beta phases. There are really two types of implants that use titanium, biomedical and dental implants. Biomedical include hip joints, knee joints, bone plates, screws for fracture fixation, pacemakers, and artificial hearts. Dental implants include crowns, which are used for only one tooth, bridges, which are used for multiple teeth in a row, and overdentures. There are many advantages to using titanium for implants, but at the same time there are some problems. One problem is that there are lots of titanium alloys, and scientists do not always know what side effects these different alloys can cause. Alloys can strengthen titanium, but some titanium alloys are harmful to the body. Alloys of titanium, aluminum, and vanadium, for example, can be toxic to the body as <coughs> aluminum and vanadium are released over time. Titanium and zirconium alloys are not toxic, but zirconium prevents the formation of calcium phosphate, making it harder for bones to grow and heal. Titanium implants are not perfect and there are still many things they need fixed and need to be improved. The first is for scientists and other researchers to discover how to maintain a low young modulus while improving both dynamic and static strength of the alloy. Another thing to be fixed is finding the right alloy for the right situation. For example, there is a search for an alloy that can be used as an implant to fix a broken bone, but at the same time be removed without re-breaking the bone it just fixed. One of the primary advantages of using titanium for implants, rather than other metals, is that bone bonds to or fuses with titanium. Implants made of pure titanium, or of some of its alloys, form a titanium oxide layer on the surface of the metal that the body recognizes, does not reject, and actually adheres itself to. This is incredibly useful for helping implants serve their purpose, which is to replace failing hard tissue, such as a tooth or joint. Metal and bone, however, are not perfectly compatible with 
those materials, and that's where things get tricky. One of the major problems when designing and implementing implant technologies is stress shielding. When bone fuses to metal, the two components together handle whatever load the body has to bear. However, the Young's modulus, or stiffness, of bone and titanium are very different. Because the metal is so much stronger than the bone, the metal implant will actually bear a disproportionate amount of the load compared to the bone. This may not seem like a bad thing, but disuse causes a loss in bone density as the tissue resorbs and can actually cause the bone to fracture or disconnect from the implant. Now, stress shielding is less dramatic with titanium implants than with implants of other metals because titanium can have a wide range of Young's moduli. Still, it's not quite low enough to eliminate the problem entirely. Material scientists and engineers are currently working to lower the Young's modulus of titanium without significantly decreasing the overall strength of the material. This is no easy task, however, as most processes that strengthen materials, such as alloying it with another metal, for example, anything that would change the interactions of the bonds tend to raise the Young's modulus when you're trying to strengthen the material, as well as the tensile and yield strengths. There are some processes, however, that could help material scientists and engineers continue to make titanium strong enough to make lasting implants while still combating the effects of stress shielding. One such process is cold working. Cold working a metal involves forcibly altering its structure without melting it. With titanium, this is done by cold rolling the material, which is rolling and pressing it into thin sheets like you'd make an aluminum foil or a similar material, or cold swaging, which is when the metal is forced through a small opening and forms a rod, beam, or wire. Cold working plastically deforms the metal, causing so many dislocations to form that the regions of tension and compression around the individual dislocations begin to overlap, and it's difficult for any of this lo those dislocations to move, and this makes it harder to deform the material, because if the dislocations can't move, then you don't have shear and the material pretty much stays where it is. This particular strengthening process is favorable for titanium implants because it increases the strength of the, ma of the material without increasing the Young's modulus, thus helping to optimize these two properties. This, however, still does not completely solve the material's challenge. Titanium can be strengthened without significantly increasing the Young's modulus, but the Young's modulus is still not compatible enough with bone. Perhaps in years to come, there will be a material that will replace titanium as the primary material of implants. It will need to have a high tensile strength, low Young's modulus, and not be toxic to the human body. This is a formidable challenge. For now, we'll rely on